I'd like to welcome all of you to tonight's uh, presentation. This is a presentation which is part of the spring lecture series of the Armenian Studies Program here at Fresno State. And tonight's lecture is co-sponsored by the Leon S. Peters Foundation, uh, which has been supporting the Armenian Studies Program lecture series for the past two years. So I would like to thank them for their uh, support. Our special guest speaker tonight is Dr. Artin Aslanian, who's a professor of history and international relations at Marist College in, in New York. But before I introduce him, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about our uh, two upcoming events in the month of March, for those of you that would be interested in attending. Uh, on March the 7th, which is a Friday night, uh, the keyboard concert series is having a concert with Sergei Babayan and Daniel Tripanov. Daniel Tripanov is an award-winning pianist, as well as Sergei Babayan. And that's going to be part of the keyboard concert series here at Fresno State. Uh, in the concert building on Friday, March 7th at 8 p.m. And all of you are welcome to attend. If you need to get your tickets, you can go online or uh, call the number uh, for the keyboard concert series. And if you're interested in that, you can talk to me about it. And then uh, in just about 10 days, the Armenian Studies Program is having its 26th annual banquet. And our special guest is going to be the newly, newly appointed president of Fresno State, Dr. Joseph Castro and his wife Mary, and they will be the special guests of the Armenian Studies program. If you're interested in attending uh, that banquet, you can see me after tonight's presentation. Those are just a couple of our upcoming events. Later on in March and April, we'll have many more. And on the table outside as you came in is a sign-in sheet if you would like to be put on our email list, which gives you uh, knowledge, for knowledge about the upcoming events. So tonight's guest lecture is Dr. Artina Slanyan from Marist College in New York. He had a very long journey today. As many of you know, the East Coast has been just covered with snow. So it was a very long journey to, uh, to get here. But fortunately, it's warming up a little bit, so he was able to make it. He's got a very interesting topic tonight. It's on Armenians, Georgians, Azerbaijanis, Arabs, and Jews, the British colonial ethos after World War I. And he'll be speaking about a very important moment in Armenian history following World War I because it was the period before, between, I should say, uh, the end of World War I and the establishment of the Armenian uh, Republic in 1918. And how did British policy specifically ad uh, address the Armenians as well as the other groups that, that I just mentioned? And he will explain how the national interests of British policy uh, shaped British policy immediately after World War I. And they made many promises, as we'll see, and we'll see how those promises uh, worked out. Dr. Arslanian received his doctorate in modern British history from UCLA and taught at St. Olaf College in Minnesota. He has also served as provost and academic vice president at the Belmont Abbey College in North Carolina and at Marist College. So he has a lot of administrative experience as well. And he has published on the British intervention in the Russian Civil War, on US Middle East policy, the Karabakh conflict, modernization and political developments in the Sultanate of Oman, and the ongoing debate regarding the Armenian Genocide. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Artin Arslanian. Dr. Arslanian. Uh, thank you, Barlow, for that introduction. I'm going to repeat it to my wife. <laughs> uh, before I go into my presentation, uh, I'd like to thank Barlow uh, for the heroic work he's doing here. I've been following the Armenian Studies program, and it's a very vibrant program compared to a number of others that I've known about. And he's done it uh, as a yeoman uh, with little help, but with tremendous support from the community. So I would like to also thank the community for having supported this program, uh, which is promising. And I, I, I am sure that it will continue to grow uh, over the years, as long as Bardo hangs around. <laughs> uh, in order to give you a general context of what I'll be talking to you about, keep in mind that you can't hear me well. Is this better? You just have to speak closer. I'll move this closer. Is this better? No. Is it on? Yeah, it's on. It is on. Just, it's got to okay. go right close. Go ahead. Ave <laughs> lave. Okay, thank you. Uh, in order to provide you a context, just a few sentences. 
regarding the fact that the British government as well as, well as the Allies were not ready for the kind of war that waged during the First World War. You've seen movies and photographs of people in the summer of 1914 living for the front and yelling to their families and fiancés that we'll be back by Christmas. The reason for that is that generals fight their current wars on the basis of what they've learned from their past wars. And the wars of the 19th century were short blitzkriegs, lightning attacks that professional armies fought against each other six, seven weeks, and that was the end of it. So that was the expectation. And as the First World War degenerated into a trench warfare, and the political leaders, as well as the military leaders, didn't know what to do, how to break that stalemate. They started thinking about any possibility that will give them an advantage over that war. So what we have here is that the government, in the case of England, made a number of public pledges and secret agreements regarding the post war settlement of the Middle East. Expediency, rather than post-war policy, informed these actions of the British government during the war. Thus, an agreement was reached with Sheriff Hussein of Mecca to begin an Arab revolt against the Ottoman Empire so that the Ottoman Empire will implode from within and will enable the Allies to send support to the Russians who were badly in need of arms, armament, ammunition to continue the war. Now, in return to the Arab revolt, Sheriff Hussein was promised an Arab kingdom by the British government. The Balfour Declaration was, prom was a promise to the Zionists in return of their efforts to exert pressure on American government to facilitate the mobilization process, to accelerate it, because we had declared war, but our troops were still not there. The English term Johnny come lately starts from this period. Uh, and of course, uh, they also believed that the Bolshevik revolutionaries in Russia were led by Jews and Zionists, and they thought that a pro-Zionist statement will keep the Soviet Russia or the new revolutionary government in the war. So these were the considerations that led to the promise by the British government to support the Zionists in terms of establishing a Jewish national home in Palestine. Jewish national home has no meaning in the political context. There is no such thing as a national home. Uh, but of course, they did not want to say state uh, because they were afraid uh, that Sheikh Hussein of Mecca will dismiss that kind of an idea. As these developments were going on, the French were getting really anxious and suspicious. The French were giving the casualties on the Western Front. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people in a single battle just to gain 20 or 30 yards of mud against the Germans uh, were sacrificing their lives. While the British, as a naval power, although they did send expeditionary forces to the Western Front, were by and large going on scale. And the French were suspicious that the British using their naval power were establishing uh, bases in the Gulf region. Uh, and they were concerned that after the war, uh, they'll end up holding the bag. So they insisted that they sit down with the British and make certain decisions about the reordering of the Middle East after the First World War if the Allies won the war. And that led to the 
famous Sykes-Picot Treaty, uh, by which the British and the French divided the Middle East into their spheres of control or influence. Now, of course, the Sykes-Picot directly contradicted the promises and agreements made with Sheriff Hussein of Mecca, who was going to have an Arab kingdom, which would have included all these Arabic-speaking regions. The contradiction was there, they knew it, but uh, we have an aphorism back home in the Middle East which goes like, the drowning man will hang on to a snake. The British were drowning and it didn't matter whether they're contradicting uh, their allies or the people they had given promises to, as long as whatever they did helped their war effort. That's the context in which these kind of decisions were made. The Russian Revolution of 1917 led to the mass, mass desertion of the Russian soldiers from all battlefields and caused, of course, the deterioration of the Russian Caucasus Front. In spite of the sympathy that the British had for the Armenians, given their ordeal in the Ottoman Empire during the first two years of the war, which includes the genocide, the British made no pledges to the Armenians during those two years until the time when the Russian soldiers started abandoning the Caucasus Front. It was only in June 1917, faced with this situation uh, on that front, that the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George made the liberation of Armenia a British war aim and decided to give military assistance to Armenians uh, so that they'll continue fighting against the Ottoman armies uh, in the Caucasus region. The idea was that if Armenians continued that struggle, the Turks and the Germans will not be able to reach Baku, which was a major oil producing region. So, the Armenians did assume the task of manning the Caucasus Front. This did slow the advance of the Ottoman armies towards the Caspian and prevented the Central Powers from exploiting Baku's oil. Inadequate British support to Baku led to its fall in September of 1918. There's a lot of controversy about this issue because the British turned around and accused the Armenians of being cowards. And that's why the Baku fell, according to them. But recent research, and of which I have used some for publications, indicates that that was not the case. The Armenians of Baku were promised a significant number of British soldiers to help them, but it never did come true. This episode notwithstanding, the end of the war generated high hopes among the various nationalities in the Middle East and among the Armenians in particular. Britain's wartime pledges and agreements, along with President Wilson's 14 points, generated high expectations among Arabs, Kurds, Armenians, and all different kinds of nationalities in the Middle East because the 14 points had declared the right for national self-determination and Woodrow Wilson had made the 14 points a precondition for joining the war and part of the Allies. These hopes were dashed in short order. The Armenians were the first to experience the disappointment with Allies and particularly British post-war policy. In November 1918, two British divisions occupied the key strategic points of Transcaucasus the, between Baku and Batum, the local republics of Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, which had declared their independence in May of that year, reacted differently to the British occupation. The Georgians, who had maintained good relations with the Germans during the war, and the Azerbaijanis, who had assisted the Ottoman of, uh, offensive uh, towards the Baku, did not welcome the British. The Armenians, on the other hand, were elated. In response, 
to Britain's request, they had defended the Caucasus Front. They had called themselves the little ally and expected to be seated at the Paris Peace Conference and anticipated the establishment of a great Armenia by uniting with allied support their ancestral lands in Eastern Anatolia and Cilicia, as well as the mountainous Karabakh region to their tiny Transcaucasian Republic. The goals, expectations, and concerns of Armenians, and for that matter of Azerbaijanis and Georgians, did not play a role in the British decision to occupy that region. British troops were dispatched to ensure Ottoman compliance with armistice terms, but more importantly, the occupation of Transcaucasia and the control of the Caspian region was also part of a larger plan to defeat the Bolshevik revolutionary regime in Russia by assisting the anti-Bolshevik Russian military elements in the Balkans, southern Russia, and the Volga region. In addition, British control of the Caspian was considered important for the defense of India. London had not formulated a policy towards the Transcaucasian republics. The commanders of the occupying forces were directed not to be involved in local territorial disputes. They were told to tell the locals that the Paris Peace Conference would eventually sort out all these internal and local problems. However, during an Eastern Committee meeting, the Eastern Committee was a committee of the War Cabinet, uh, which was given the task of formulating a policy in Transcaucasia. They never managed to do it. However, during one of its meetings on the 2nd December of 1918, Lord Curzon, the chairman, did raise the question of British wartime pledges to Armenians. He supported the creation of a greater Armenia with the addition of the six eastern provinces of Anatolia and Cilicia to the Transcaucasian Republic of Armenia. The creation of such a large Armenian state under the mandate of a Western nation would redeem Britain's wartime pledges. However, such a mandate would impose too colossal a burden on British resources. And Lord Curzon believed that the mandate for Armenia should be taken either by the United States or France, thus freeing Britain from its obligations. Two weeks later, referring to Armenians as well as Georgians and Azerbaijanis, Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour made clear that he did not want to squander his words, money and men, in civilizing a few people who do not want to be civilized. End of quote. There was a general dissatisfaction with the outcome of British intervention in the region, and British prestige was severely damaged. One of the main objectives of the Transcaucasian republics were international recognition of their independence. The British government refused to support their quest for independence so long as the anti-Bolshevik camp in the Russian Civil War had a chance to win that war. It was no secret that none of the white Russian leaders was ready to leave Transcaucasia out of a future Russia. For London, and particularly the War Office, nothing justified antagonizing the friendly Russians, the white Russians. Only after Denikin's defeat did the British government grant de facto recognition and military support to Transcaucasian republics in a belated and vain attempt to prevent the Bolshevik conquest of the region. In the summer of 1919, British forces began the evacuation of Transcaucasia. It had become evident to London that quick demobilization of the soldiers and growing unrest in Egypt, Iraq, and Ireland made continued intervention in the Russian Civil War unfeasible. The post-war British economy was in no condition to address the demands of an extended empire. We understand these these days, right? Okay, as Harry Wilson, the chief of the Imperial General Staff stated, 
in no single theater we are strong enough. Troops were needed elsewhere in the Middle East, a region now considered strategically more important to the British imperial interests than Transcaucasia, despite Baku's oil resources. The decision to withdraw the troops from Transcaucasia was reached in London in the spring of 1919. A year later, when some of the republics established commercial ties with Moscow and, in the absence of Western assistance, adopted pro-Soviet orientations as a last resort for maintaining their independence, the Foreign Office absolved the British government from honoring its pledges to them. The contrast between Wilson's 14 points and Allied wartime pledges, on the one hand, with the stark realities of immediate post-war British and Allied policies on the other, led to disillusionment and sense of betrayal. A confidential foreign summary, foreign office summary of Britain's involvement in Transcaucasia points out that Britain's pro-Russian policy and decisions to withdraw her troops from Transcaucasia, now I am quoting from the document, caused violent dissatisfaction in Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Dagestan, and seriously affected the confidence of their people in the word and good faith of His Majesty's government. Their nearest interest counted for little, their future for nothing, when weighed by Great Britain against her own immediate convenience. She was charged, indeed, with having broken faith with the republics. In September 1919, the organ of the Georgian Social Democratic Party, Ertoba, warned the Armenians about the futility of relying on British goodwill by reminding them of the proverbial advance, advice given to boatmen, pray to God, but keep on rowing. It cautioned all three republics of the futility of expecting outside help in fulfilling their traditional and diplomatic ambitions. In view of wartime promises given by Britain, the Armenians were the most disappointed by British post-war policies. The Armenian press accused the British of reneging on their promises, disregarding the rights and dignity of the local people, and behaving in Transcaucasia in a manner which would be unthinkable at home. This duplicitous behavior, the Armenian press claimed, was typical of perfidious Alb Albion. An Armenian daily warned its readers that neither capitalist United States, nor perfidious Albion, nor egotistic France would assist Armenia because, quote, the blood-drained Armenian democracy was of no use to this pack of predatory imperialists. A Foreign Office report states that the Bolshevik propaganda fully exploited the growing demoralization within the Armenian Republic by pointing to the folly of relying upon any external aid except that of the Soviet regime and its new ally, Turkey. Local disappointments and dissatisfaction with Britain and the actions and behavior of its troops did not register much concern in London. British interests trumped all other considerations. An additional reason for this indifference to local opinion was the mindset of the majority of the members of the British government and the British officers throughout the Middle East and Transcaucasia. They had a poor opinion of the local population. Major General William Thompson, the commander of the British Expeditionary Force, which landed in Baku from Persia, considered the Transcaucasian republics the creation and puppets of Germany and Turkey. He didn't take their claim to independence seriously as he regarded this region to be a legitimate part of Russia. General George Milne, in charge of military operations in Transcaucasia, did not believe that the republics deserved Britain's attention. According to him, their leaders were dishonest, illiterate, 
or worse, Bolsheviks. They would need the ministration of a civilizing power for at least two generations to be able to govern themselves. The withdrawal of British troops would surely create chaos, but this didn't matter. The world would not miss much if these people killed each other. They were not worth the life of a single British private. I'm quoting him again. The Georgians are merely disguised Bolsheviks, led by a man who overthrew Kerensky and were friendly to Lenin. The Armenians are what the Armenians have always been, a despicable race. The best are the inhabitants of Azerbaijan, though they are really uncivilized." End of quote. Major Edward Noel, uh, the British intelligence officer in Kurdistan, considered the Armenians to be, his words, timid, avaricious, and deceitful. End of quote. Total disregard for local sensibilities was also displayed by some British soldiers on their way to their barracks from dinner given in their honor by the mayor of Batum, they sang the Russian imperial national anthem at the top of their voices, a blatant insult to the Georgian government and Georgian independence. In London, the chief of imperial general staff, Sir Henry Wilson, was equally dismissive of the republics. He believed that autocracy, preferably the Russian kind, was more suitable for these republics than democracy. After all, they were all uncivilized brutes, quote, as regards brutality and bestiality, I do not suppose there's a tissue paper between Greeks, Bulgars, Turks, Armenians and Kurds, and even Germans, end of quote. These come from his memoirs and from his letters to a prime minister. Although there was sympathy in certain quarters in London regarding the Transcaucasian republics, and particularly Armenian, few were willing to jeopardize British national interests for them. Agreements and pledges were made to win the war, not to shape British post-war policy. As Prime Minister David Lloyd George reminded his war cabinet, his commitments in a speech in January 1918 to post-war recognition of independence of Arabia, Armenia, Syria, Palestine, and Mesopotamia was a war rather than a peace strategy. He told the Allied Supreme War Council that speeches were not binding. Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour amplified on the Prime Minister's statements that speeches like the pledges given to Armenians were not legally binding, only written agreements were. But in late 1917 and early 1918, the British government was willing to renege on written agreements like Saxe-Picot as well in order to get the Ottoman Empire to withdraw from the war. Commitments, agreements, treaties, and pledges were reinterpreted, honored, or dismissed in order to further British interests. Another example of this behavior is the case of Britain's commitment for the creation of an independent Arabia. General Milner wrote to Prime Minister Lloyd George, who was at the Paris Peace Conference, that the Italians wanted to discuss the independence of Arabia, but he refused to do so. He added, quote, the independence of Arabia has always been a fundamental principle of our Eastern strategy. But what we mean by it is that Arabia, while being independent herself, should be kept out of the sphere of European political intrigue and within British sphere of influence. In other words, that the independent native rulers should have no foreign treaties except with us. But what the Italians evidently mean by it is that those rulers should be able to enter into any relations they please with any foreign country which is exactly the opposite to our policy and threatens many amount of future trouble for us. So even the term independent had to be massaged to fit their own interest. Like Winston Churchill in the War Cabinet, 
Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour was opposed to devoting British troops to keep order in Transcaucasia or protect it from the Russian invasion. India, Egypt, Ireland, where unrest was brewing already, were the British priorities. It was not Britain's responsibility to civilize the people of Transcaucasia who didn't want to be civilized. They should be allowed to cut each other's throat. This condescension was not confined to the peoples of Transcaucasia. It applied to all inhabitants of British-occupied parts of the Middle East. General Sir Walter Congrave, who succeeded General Edwin Allenby as commander of British forces in Palestine and Egypt, wrote from Cairo that he equally disliked Muslims, Muslim Arabs, Jews, and Christians in Syria and Palestine. Quote, they are all alike, a beastly people, the whole lot of them are not worth one Englishman. End of quote. Sir Henry Wilson replied, I quite agree with you that the whole lot, Arabs, Jews, Christians, Syrians, Levantines, Greeks, etc., are not worth one Englishman. He and General Aramley were of the same opinion. This attitude, with some exceptions, reflected a general British sense of superiority of Westerners, particularly of the British, and their civilization over the peoples and civilizations of what they called the Orient. The general opinion held that Orientals, Indians, Arabs, Armenians, Jews, Transcaucasians, were culturally inferior, they were accustomed to absolute rule, thus incapable of self-government, irrational, shifty, unreliable, violent, inferior to the average Englishman or European. This sense of superiority was reinforced by the popularity of the social Darwinian construct of a hierarchy regarding the relative fitness and level of advancement of different nations, races, and civilizations. Needless to say, it was taken for granted that the Western nations and the Western civilizations were ranked at the top of this hierarchy. Lord Curzon, the former Viceroy of England and Foreign Secretary in 1919, saw the British Empire as, his words, the greatest instrument of good the world has ever seen. End of quote. Joseph Chamberlain, the former colonial secretary, considered the British a great governing race. The prevailing Orientalist attitude which drew clear distinctions between Westerners and non-Westerners, between us and them, was not confined to Europeans. In 1909, the U.S. Bureau of Naturalization and Immigration argued that Middle Easterners, including Armenians, could not qualify for U.S. citizenship because they did not belong to the white race. The citizenship of an Armenian in Portland, Oregon, was challenged by the U.S. government in 1923 on the same grounds, that he was not white. This sense of national superiority and condescension towards the inhabitants of Transcaucasia and the Middle East, combined, combined with the primacy of national interest, provided British policymakers with rationalization for their broken pledges and agreements. General Allenby was irate that the Paris Peace Conference was reneging on the promises made to Sharif Hussein of Mecca of an Arab kingdom and reviving the Sykes-Picot Agreement, caught in its worst form by cutting up the Middle East into British and French spheres of control. He predicted trouble for the French and the British in the future. These decisions were being made without consultation with the local population and against their wishes. The Arabs were bitterly opposed to the division of Syria, and he believed that Britain was committing, his words, a grievous error in deceiving the Arabs, and warned that this breach of faith will probably result in serious outbreaks against the British and the Zionists. Upon reading Allenby's telegram, a member of the British general staff noted that he was sorry 
that the politicians had made impossible commitments to people with divergent goals in the Middle East, and thus gotten Britain involved in such dirty business. But he concluded, I'm quoting him, we should not let our sorrow to interfere with imperial interests. The choice was either to honor promises to the Arabs or to the French. As France was in a position toward Britain the most, promises to Arabs were not honored, and the saxe picot Treaty served as a blueprint for reconstructing the post-war Middle East. British national interest, rather than pledges or written, written commitments, informed the British government's foreign policy in this post-war period. This orientalist mindset also allowed them to rationalize the broken pledges and agreements with Armenians, Arabs, and other national groups in the Middle East. After all, a gentleman's word was good so long as it was given to another gentleman. Not when it involved people who were considered inferior, uncivilized, shifty, unreliable, and incapable of governing themselves or joining the family of nation states. Armenian leaders, however, continued to remind the Foreign Office of their nation's wartime sacrifices on behalf of the Allies and of Britain's wartime pledges. A junior Foreign Office clerk was irked by one of the many Armenian pleas for British assistance on moral grounds. He commented, quote, this is going a little too far. If any people had everything to gain by fighting and nothing to lose, it was the Armenians. They were fighting for their own independence against their hereditary enemy, and the success of the Allies was necessary for them to attain their objective." End of quote. This was an apt summary of the post-war attitude of the British government towards Armenians, Arabs, and other Middle Eastern nationalities. And in view of the absence of any reference to wartime pledges made, made to them, and particularly the Armenians, an affirmation of the duplicitous nature of British policy. It is not surprising that none of the senior officials in, of the Foreign Office responded to this comment by this junior officer or referred to promises made to Armenians. They knew better. Thank you. <laughs>